I have a younger brother, Ian, and as children, we were always squabbling over who got to sit on mum's lap to watch TV or who got to lick the bowl when mum was making a cake. You know, the good old sibling rivalry thing that drives parents nuts. As the eldest, I considered it my place to be first when it came to anything involving my brother. But as the youngest, he often got uh, his own way, which didn't endear me to him very much. You expect that sort of behaviour in children, don't you? But what about as adults? Fortunately, as we grew older, my brother and I became friends and took a good relationship into our adulthood. But that doesn't always happen in families, does it? Sometimes the rivalry can continue. Today we are going to hear, firstly, about the disciples arguing yet again on who is the greatest, and secondly, Peter's denial of Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, remind us often, Lord, when we are feeling proud, arrogant, beyond reproach, pleased with ourselves, self-sufficient in our ways, that for such as us and better and worse, you walked a road that took you to a cruel cross and rose again to show us where we might look for rescue. Let your spirit open our hearts and minds to you this morning to humble ourselves and recognise that there are times when we exalt ourselves over others. Teach us through your word to always put the needs of others before our own. Amen. We continue this week in Luke, where Tom left off last Sunday. So we begin today with Luke 22, verse 24, where we read, A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Former world heavyweight boxing champ Muhammad Ali was known for often, often bragging, I am the greatest. Just before takeoff on an airline flight, the stewardess reminded Ali to fasten his seatbelt. Superman don't need no seatbelt, Ali told her. The stewardess retorted, Superman don't need no airplane either. Ali fastened his seatbelt, and that's taken from the Little Brown Book of Anecdotes by Clifton Fadman. No one would mistake Muhammad Ali's bragging as a Christian vir virtue. Humility and selflessness are to mark the believer in Jesus Christ. Since we all know this, it seems incredible that the apostles would get into this silly debate over which of them was the greatest, especially when you consider the setting, the Last Supper, the night before Jesus would go to the cross. The Lord had just announced that one of the twelve would betray him. The disciples had responded by discussing who would do such a thing. Yet here was Jesus about to lay down his life for these men, centering his attention on their needs, loving them very tenderly and intensely while his heart goes out to them. They are quarrelling about the question, who of us is the greatest? What made their attitude even more reprehensible was that they had been reprimanded before for this selfish attitude. This wasn't the first time that the 12 had gotten into this sort of silly debate. In Mark 9, 33 to 37, they had argued about the same matter while they walked at some distance from Jesus, thinking that he couldn't hear what they were discussing. But he knew what they were discussing and used the occasion to teach them about childlike humility. On another occasion, found in Mark 10, 35 to 45, the mother of James and John had come to Jesus to ask that her sons could sit on his right and left in the kingdom. The other disciples were indignant. What right had these two brothers to claim top spots in the kingdom? Last week, we heard, about, we heard from Tom about the plot to kill Jesus. Luke places his account of this latest dispute among the disciples concerning who was regarded as the greatest immediately after verse 23, in which we are told the disciples were discussing who it was among them who might be the betrayer of whom Jesus had just spoken. And then they launched into their squabble about who was the greatest. It is as though the disciples were more interested in their own greatness 
than in identifying who among them was the traitor. There is little time to look for traitors when one is disputing about his greatness. I wonder how civil or subtle this debate was. Among many, the struggle for position and power can be very polite, very orderly, and very underhanded. The disciples were probably more frank and not so subtle. Remember that James and John were known as the sons of thunder. These fellows were the kind who could have come to blows over such matters, at least before they met the master. You would think that right after the Lord's Supper, this sort of dispute among these men would not have happened, but it did. Pride and selfishness, which are related, are the most common and troubling problems we face. If these men who had walked in close relationship with Christ could fall into the pride of proclaiming their own greatness right after the Lord's Supper, then we are not immune. This shows that although we can have this lesson in our heads, it takes a while to put it into practice. We just think that we've learned it once and for all when someone does something to bug us and we think, I'm a better servant of Christ than he is. Although we may not get into a verbal debate, the thought of our heart is, I'm greater than he is. So we all have to keep coming back to this fundamental lesson. This is a lesson that all who are actively serving Christ must continually apply. But it also applies to Christians who are sitting on the bench, not engaged in serving the Lord. Being a servant of Christ is a mindset where each day you make yourself available to Christ and ask him to use you in his service in whatever way he chooses. It may be to speak a word about the Saviour to someone who needs him. It may be to offer cheerful help to someone in need. It may be to listen to a person who needs sympathy or understanding. But whatever the job, your daily attitude is, Lord, here I am, use me as your servant. If you're not living that way, then you are living for self, not for Christ. True greatness is to be found in faithfulness to Jesus, not in trying to exalt oneself over others. In verse 25, Jesus responds to the disciples by saying to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. Jesus showed the disciples that their egotism was a worldly pagan trait. He reminded them of the self-centeredness of the kings of the Gentiles. These men, while exercising their authority ruthlessly, nevertheless took delight in being called benefactors. Then Jesus continues in verses 26 and 27. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as one who serves? This mention, mention of the youngest in verse 26 is where we might have expected the least. Under normal conditions, the Bible regarded old age as honourable and to be held in respect. Jesus wants the greatest to become like the youngest, the one least in honour. He wants the leader to serve. Does true greatness really consist in having someone wait on you? Jesus answers this question by stating that I am among you as one who serves. His entire earthly sojourn was a life of rendering service to others in so many ways. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Was not this the essence of his purpose in coming to earth? Ignoring their many defects, Jesus praises them for the faithfulness they have shown throughout his many trials, verse 28. Others by hundreds had left the Saviour. These men, Judas accepted, had remained loyal to him. This loyalty had been expressed beautifully by Peter as their spokesperson and by Thomas. 
Isn't it amazing to think of the fact that the apostles were foolish in so many ways, but they got the sticking with Jesus thing right, and that made all the difference. Verses 31 to 34 say, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Have you ever thanked God that you weren't around when the Bible was being written so that your failures were not recorded for all people of all time to read about? I know I certainly am. Poor Peter was there and everyone knows about his colossal failure. Like Peter, we all have failed the Lord, even if our failures are not as widely known. When you fail the Lord, whether it is a colossal fall like Peter's, or even if it's a lesser failure, you feel guilty, embarrassed and depressed. If it's a bad fall, you often wonder if God will ever use you again in his service. Thank God that the Bible offers hope for those who have failed God. It does not leave us without a way out. Also, thank God that the Bible paints its heroes, warts and all. It does not airbrush their blemishes from the record. It lets us see them as men and women like us who struggled against the same weaknesses and temptations but who recovered from their sins and failures by God's abundant grace. When we fail the Lord, his grace points the way back and gives us hope. Like Peter, we have all failed the Lord. Jesus tells Peter that Satan has demanded permission to sift him like wheat. This reveals Christ's supernatural knowledge of events before God's throne. To sift like wheat pictures grain running through a sieve, where the head of grain is taken apart. Satan wanted to tear Peter apart and leave him in pieces. Somewhat surprisingly, God granted Satan's request. In his inscrutable purposes, God uses Satan, who thinks that he will achieve his evil purpose, but God overrules him and turns it for his greater purpose of good. Satan is on a leash and can go no further than God allows. Note that Satan especially goes after those who are in spiritual leadership. The pronoun you in verse 31 is plural, pointing to Satan's sifting of all the apostles. But Peter as the leader among the apostles is especially singled out. He would fail in the most dramatic way, but God would use his failure after he had recovered to strengthen the others who had also failed. Behind spiritual failure is blindness to our own weaknesses and to the Lord's warning of danger. Peter was foolishly confident in his own commitment to the Lord, so much so that he contradicted Jesus' own words. We often flatter ourselves into thinking, Others may fall, but I'm strong. Back in the late 80s into the early 90s, I left the church for years because of not recognising that I was being led by my own weaknesses. It's interesting that verse 34 is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus calls Peter by this name which he gave him. It means rock. The Lord is gently saying, Peter, you are a rock only when you rely on me, not on yourself. You think that you're a rock in yourself, but Peter, you are about to fall. So how do we understand why Jesus would allow sorrow and suffering in the lives of those who trust him and follow him ardently? Trials and testings come for various reasons. Whatever the reason for testing, we know that testing is a necessary part of growing and being grounded in deep faith for a believer. Consider this situation. Students have to write exams every year in order to be promoted to a higher class. If you argue saying, why can't you just promote the child, 
they've attended classes all through the year. It just does not work that way. Sure, sure they attended classes for a year, but what did they learn? How much did that have they taken in? How much of it has become part of them? All these and many more questions need to be answered. Hence, an exam is the appointed way to evaluate the understanding and learning process of a student. Similarly, if anyone contends saying they've attended church services week after week throughout the year and therefore deserve to enter heaven, it just doesn't work that way. Testing and proving of our faith is essential in order to qualify to enter heaven. In the science of metals, you study about tensile strength. It indicates the resistance of a metal to break under tension or pressure. The more pressure a piece of steel or iron is able to withstand, that much more the grade and that much more its price. Even so, God wants us to be strong and steadfast believers. Proverb 24.10 says, If you faint in the day of trouble, your strength is small. When engineers plan the construction of a building, they make sure it has a strong foundation, that its walls and windows are well designed, and that in times of earthquake, fire or storm, it should withstand the trauma. If an engineer takes such care for a building, how much more does the Lord God, our loving Father, take caution and care to build our faith when he created us, saved us and called us? Know this truth in the depths of your heart, my dear friends, that no trial or testing can harm you. The Bible says in Psalm 37, 23 and 24, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. The Lord will be by your side protecting you and guiding you as you obey and move in him. There's no one as kind as Jesus. Peter was about to deny his Lord. Instead of being reprimanded in advance, Jesus encouraged him. He not only prayed for Peter, but gave him something to hold on to once the aftermath of his sinful decision was realised. Jesus let him know that he'd be restored and that restoration would be the fuel he could use to strengthen others. That's just how Jesus is. He knows ahead of time when we'll fail, yet he never treats us with disdain. He points us towards our destiny. He reminds us that he's already made provision for our mistakes. Jesus loves to nudge us forward so we don't get stuck in the guilt of past blunders and he never looks at our sin as a wall that can keep him out. He continues talking to us as if we'd never sinned at all. Pretty amazing and humbling, isn't it? Please join me in prayer. Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Fill our vision with destiny and purpose. We know that we will not always be faithful, that we will fail despite our best intentions. But we pray that we don't let our failures stand as the final verdict on us, but use them to strengthen our resolve in the future and help those who face trials that we now know from the inside out. Jesus, we want to be like Peter, the model disciple, not because he never failed, but because he turned back. You revive our heart and flood it with new life. You call us friend. Amen. Please stand again with me and as we sing our final song, The Lion and the Lamb.